the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Daryl, rebuild my church. Well, I know that the man who heard that 800 years ago is not named Daryl. But I do know his name was Francis. And I love the fact that today, being the Feast of St. Francis, is the day that you are being consecrated because there's a great deal that Jesus wants to say to you. And so when this wealthy son of a cloth merchant suddenly went into a rundown church called Chiesa uh, San, let's see, usually it's tra Damiano, Damian, when he went to San Damiano's church, he saw this extraordinary cross above the altar. It had a very Byzantine look to it, meaning that you could still see the uh, influence of the Byzantines upon the Italians. Well, they'll reluctantly agree to that. But there it was, this beautiful cross above a run-down church, and as Francis is trying to figure out what his life and ministry is going to be like, because he and his dad weren't on the best of terms right then. Francis wanted to follow Jesus. Francis' dad wanted him to follow him. And so Francis being a literalist, I guess maybe some would say a biblical fundamentalist, he took to heart the words, Francis, rebuild my church. So as Francis looked around, what did he discover? There was definitely some extra work that needed to be done on that building. <laughs> Stones, rocks, it was terrible. And so Francis, trying to figure out what that meant, started moving blocks and started putting things back together, and eventually some other people started joining him. Now the problem is when people start doing good things and people actually start joining them, they want to start making up rules. You know, there was probably somebody in a crowd and said, is that in the Constitution and Canons? <laughs> so all Francis wanted to do was do what Jesus said. So this meant in the minds of some, you have to get approval from somebody who lives in Rome. Uh, this is about 800 years ago. Is this settling in? Well, the Bishop of Rome really enjoyed his Benedictines. And he enjoyed some of the other religious orders. But looking at a man who looked like a beggar, standing before him, he was not interested in seeing Francis. Francis looked like he spent all of his time in the streets. But then the Bishop of Rome had a dream. In his dream, he saw a church slanted. And it wasn't falling because there was a beggar man holding it up. And Francis finally had to come to grips with the fact that when he was told to rebuild my church, that he wasn't talking about the local parish church of San Damiano. To put it another way, even though I'm afraid that he doesn't get his due, I think he spends more time in bird baths and in gardens. St. <laughs> Francis was a reformer. He's not noted as a reformer, unfortunately, but he was a reformer. He worked within the church to recall the church to what she was called to be as a servant. To put it a little differently, looking at the various elements of our Lord's ministry, St. Francis saw himself washing feet. He had been taught that by Jesus. And so he sought to wash feet, indeed he did. But the problem was, you heard the word, didn't you? Rebuild my church. So in a variety of ways, St. Francis realized that he had to be a builder. My dear brother in Christ, 
you will be told many things about the titles that are applied to bishops. Here's the problem. Many people are going to tell you about the functions of a bishop. But you see, we are in a unique situation where we don't have our own sacraments and we don't have our own orders of ministry. One of our archbishops of Canterbury is very clear about it. He said, we have no doctrine of our own. You know, we have no orders of ministry but our own. Bishop, priest, and deacon. And everything else you're going to be called is probably a function. For example, you'll ask, be asked to function as a pastor, but we don't use that term in our tradition as an order of ministry. That's not a word that's synonymous with clergy, for example, or synonymous with priest. It's not. We have a threefold ministry, bishop, priest, deacons. And here you are. Now, people will say, but I'm more interested in the function. Well, there's some people in, let's just say, other ways of expressing the faith who've decided that talking about Jesus as, or talking about God as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is not helpful. So they say, why don't we just say the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sanctifier? Same thing. Oh, I don't think so. That's not the essence of what God is. Those are mere functions that simply cannot explain what exactly God is to us. We've had that heresy, been there, done that, and burned the t-shirt. <laughs> you are called to be a bishop, and you're going to be much more than a pastor. That'll be one of your functions. But I submit to you that you're called to be a pontifex. Now, that term has been misused, and it can be variously translated from the Latin, but by and large, if we look carefully at it, the word pontifex means bridge builder. And that's what I think a bishop is called to be. Now, in being a pontifex, he's going to have to also be a good pastor, a good listener, a good prayer, a good preacher, all those other things that people sometimes think define our essence when only it's defining our function. But a pontifex coming out of that order that you've been called to and being a bridge builder is remarkable. And I'll tell you why. Now, I recognize there are some of us who are actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and some of us who served in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and some who would like to claim Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but I can assure you when the bridges were down, we were all in trouble. Most of us from Pittsburgh are directionally challenged because we're not caring about whether we're going north, south, east, or west. We just want to know if the bridge is open. <laughs> but the reason the bridge is important is because without the bridge, you can't get there from here. And the bridge has to be Jesus because very clear in Scripture, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So that means you have to walk the way of Jesus, which means you have to cross a number of bridges. You'll have to go to places you never thought you would dream of ever being in. You're going to have to meet people halfway on some bridges so that you can talk about whether you can go any further on that bridge. But you're called to be a bridge builder. Now there is a man by the name of Andrew Carnegie, who's well known in some circles, who decided that bridges were essential, but not everybody was willing to trust this brand new material that he was trying to put out there through his Keystone Bridge Company, which was called steel. And the point that he was trying to make is, you need to have something that will not only support the weight but will allow you to go even farther than you've been able to go before. In fact, some of the people in Pittsburgh weren't as trusting initially of Andrew Carnegie. I mean, later they would claim him. But one bridge that he built was between St. Louis, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri was remarkable because Andrew Carnegie had heard that an elephant is so aware of its existence that it won't go onto something that 
thinks would not be supported. And so Andrew Carnegie had an elephant walk across the bridge. Suddenly, bridges started to sell. Now, I'm not going to talk about any elephants in the room. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you that the people are going to be trusting you so much that they'll want to know whether it's safe to go across that bridge or safe to go down that road. Safe enough to be able to proceed. And part of it will be, if you really take seriously the concept of Pontifex, that while others are doing all sorts of incredible ministries which we can appreciate, being a bishop is simply different. It's not being a senior pastor. We don't use those terms. Good reason why we don't do that. Well, as I get older, I think the word senior isn't all that helpful, but that's just a... <laughs> But that's because of the fact that we believe that the essence of the office does not require a descriptive. A bishop is a bishop. A priest is a priest. A deacon is a deacon. And what will be asked of you, indeed what will be expected of you, is that as you test those bridges and take those people across, that you will be keeping their eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, that you will be pointing clearly to him as the only way, that while others are trying every conceivable way that they can possibly try, the only way is Jesus. Now, one of the remarkable things as I look around and see faces, familiar faces, we talked about you a long time ago. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We were talking about how can we put together a diocese that will be truly faithful? And what kind of a bishop do we need to have? And that, my friends, was before something called ACNA. It came out of the work that we were doing in Forward in Faith, and therefore the diocese to which you're being, you'll be consecrated into as a, as a bishop, but serving as a bishop comes out of numerous councils, meetings, and conversations about what kind of a diocese do we believe that Forward in Faith should have that would be helpful and useful in what we see ahead of us that would become known as the ACNA. You look forward and you see your two predecessors in that regard, and I can assure you they were a part of those meetings. Didn't have your name yet, but I've got it now. And now what is it? Well, we said we wanted to be OCT. Not to be confused with OCD, I might add. We wanted to be OCT. We wanted to be orthodox, conservative, and traditional. That's what we determined as a diocese that we would be. And what else did we determine? We would not incorporate the innovations that came to the faith that, uh, let, let's just say, uh, many years after the fact. We will continue with what we had received. Put differently, the Vincentian canon is very clear. We simply continue to believe what has been believed by all people in all places at all times. It, it sounds simple, but when you're walking across the bridge, you're going to have people who are going to point to other roads. They're going to say, but it's easier to get across this way. I want you to know that there is no easy way to be a bishop, and it only happens by virtue of God's grace. And when you're willing to submit yourself totally and completely to him. You're not an officer, you're not up for promotion, we don't do that. In fact, one of the things that we can't even do, we can't even make you an Anglican bishop. We can make you a bishop to serve in the Anglican church. And when we know the distinction between the two, then we're on the right track. We do not own the sacraments, nor do we own the orders. You, indeed, in a matter of moments, will be in apostolic succession in Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And when we're faithful and we listen, every now and then we even have some apostolic success. 
Would you stand, please? My brother in Christ, I want you to know that the order is an order for which many have died. Bishops have been killed simply for being bishops. Today, Christian persecution is so significantly on the rise that there are places where people are almost afraid to say they're Christians. We have become so absolutely self-absorbed in many places in the world today, we don't even care about history anymore. I want you to know, and this is very important, that you literally are standing on the shoulders of many who have gone before you. I know you know that, but I want you to know, not just some of the people you see here, but there are people who desperately prayed that the church would be faithful. And that's what God wants you to continue to be, is faithful. But now he wants to empower you so that you might have the grace to be able to do what he wants you to do when he says, Bishop Daryl, rebuild my church. You'll walk across one bridge and you'll see a church that needs more of your care than perhaps another. But if you keep your eyes firmly fixed on him and your ears open, he'll show you and he'll tell you exactly what he wants you to do. And so, let's look at the prayer that is attributed to St. Francis as our conclusion. Because in that prayer, if you review it and remember that you were consecrated on this day, the Feast of St. Francis, and I remind you, do you know what the September the 17th feast is for St. Francis? That's the commemoration of the day that he received the stigmata. So serving oftentimes means being crucified with Christ. But it also means being able to rise with him. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And now, my brother, start rebuilding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.